As we forge ahead into the second half of an already record-breaking hurricane season, these last few months have been chock full with a series of firsts. Most recently, just a few weeks ago when Hurricane Laura slammed into Louisiana. The National Weather Service issued the exceptionally rare extreme wind warning when Hurricane Laura was packing winds close to an EF3 tornado as it pulled away from coastal Louisiana. The EWW has only been issued a handful of times in the last 16 years, and it's meant to prompt immediate action for people that could be in the path of life-threatening winds ahead of a landfalling hurricane. It was a stifling hot summer back in 2004. The hurricane season was already busy, but it would be a season few Floridians would soon forget. Hurricane Charlie was one of four hurricanes that would eventually slam into Florida that year and one of the strongest hurricanes to ever hit the continental U.S., prompting unprecedented extreme wind warnings almost statewide. Florida's southwest Gulf Coast had never experienced conditions even close to those which were fast approaching. Hurricane Charlie had a brief but explosive tropical lifespan. On August 9, 2004, a tropical depression formed over the eastern Atlantic. In just four short days, it would catapult into a dangerous Category 4 hurricane with winds near 150 miles an hour. Charlie's path would change several times, but the final pivot would call for a southwest Florida landfall. But what few Floridians expected is that hundreds of miles away from where Charlie came in, it would maintain its hurricane intensity throughout nearly the entire length of Florida, delivering extreme winds in parts of the state that rarely had to deal with hurricanes at all. Charlie's track would bring the core of the strongest winds directly across Orlando, the most densely populated interior city in the state. It was considered a one in 100 year hurricane event, and most of the state, central Florida in particular, wasn't prepared for the over 100 mile per hour winds that blasted into town. We at the Melbourne office, uh, we developed this warning back in 2004 where Hurricane Charlie was making landfall in the Florida Peninsula. And it was originally forecast to move up the West Coast, but then the track had veered and it was gonna move right across the central Florida area, right across the, the middle of the state, across Orlando and to Daytona Beach. So we really wanted a, a means to come up with a you know, high visibility product to, to really uh, break away from all the other type of warnings that are out there, you know, really, really uh, get people's attention at the time. So we devised the, the warning then. Uh, we used it again during Hurricane Gene later that year when it struck the Southeast Florida coast. And then it was used in, a, in an experimental mode the following year, four times for four different hurricanes during 2005, during that very busy season. And then it wasn't used again until uh, Hurricane uh, Matthew in 2016. That's when it became an official National Weather Service product across the entire country. And ironically, the Melbourne office was again the office to use that for the first time. The EWW is similar to issuing a tornado warning, but on a much larger scale. The warning area could impact hundreds of miles. The EWWs have only been issued a handful of times since Hurricane Charlie. Over the last few years, the EWW was used for hurricanes Matthew, Michael, Irma, and Maria. It's considered one of the most critical warnings the National Weather Service can issue. And when it is, the implications could be life-threatening, as was the case with Hurricane Laura in late August of this year. Something that grabbed a lot of headlines was the fact that the Hurricane Center said that that storm surge would not be survivable for people that did not evacuate. Do you think that we're at a time in this society where we have to get that type of extreme warning from the Hurricane Centers and the weather offices? Yeah, there is some social science research going on just about everything the National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center do these days are uh, you know, put through that social um, science filter uh, to see really what, what are the um, impl implications of use of that product by emergency management, by the media, and of course by the general public. So there's a lot of research going into that. And I think if we look back to all these major hurricanes of 2000, uh, 2004, 2005, and then uh, the most recent years, 2000, since 2016, that have impacted the coastline, uh, you know, on many, many major hurricanes, a lot of really extreme wind coming inland, but a very few injuries and fatalities from those winds. So, uh, you know, there, there is a, a certainly a, a big 
area of interest and get people, getting people out of the storm surge zone along the immediate coastline. But then when you get outside of the storm surge zone, really uh, we want people to be keyed in on how extreme those winds can be and the damage that those winds can produce, uh, even across far inland areas. You know, they, they can take down trees, and when the trees come down and fall on cars or and fall on homes, uh, there can be injuries and even fatalities in those situations. If you're outside of the storm surge zone, Treat it like a tornado warning. You've been waiting for the hurricane, you know it's coming, that's not a surprise to you. But now that warning is telling you the most extreme winds from that hurricane are gonna impact your immediate area and they're imminent. So you wanna to go to your, your safest place in your shelter, away from the exterior walls, away from windows. It's the same thing you would do for a tornado approaching your area if you're outside of a storm surge zone. The National Weather Service will issue these rare and potentially lethal warnings when winds are expected to be greater than 115 miles an hour, which can be similar to tornado force winds lasting up to an hour or more far away from the hurricane center. It's considered one of the last attempts to warn the public about the severity of the weather event that's about to impact them. Yeah, I really think it's made a big difference. Uh, we, we envisioned that the new warning would be a unique way to really elevate the visibility of a high impact weather event. Uh, something to get people's attention at the very last minute for hazardous life threatening weather conditions. So we wanted to, to think outside the box and come up with a different type of warning where, you know, previous warnings, people are used to this. This is a warning that would only be issued on a very, very rare event. and. Uh, you know, really meant to get people's attention, to get to allow them to get to their place of safety right away before those winds strike. So what was some of the logic and some of the um, inspiration behind the extreme wind warnings? Well, initially for us with Charlie, uh, being an inland wind event, uh, we know that uh, people on the coastline are more, uh, maybe more used to and, and ready for those type of winds, but for areas away from the coastline, uh, like happened uh, across the central Florida area all the way inland to Orlando in 2004. And then uh, a few years ago, the Hurricane Michael, when it spread up across the, the far inland areas, the Florida Panhandle into Georgia and Alabama, people further inland aren't, aren't really used to that or aren't expecting those high winds to impact far inland areas. So uh, we wanted a warning really to, to uh, have that visibility, to, to um, have a higher tier of alerting to get people's attention so that they can take shelter far away from the, the coastline. If the 2020 hurricane season is any indication, there will be plenty of opportunity to use the EWW in the future. The National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service consider the extreme wind warning as one of their best lines of defense against a brutal hurricane and its impacts. Obviously a very, very busy season underway, uh, at least for us here along the Florida coast and the Gulf of Mexico coast. Uh, the majority of the weather we get from hurricanes occurs during the latter part of the season. So really about now through the next um, six weeks or so really is our impact time period, you know, our, our greatest occurrence for hurricanes. Um, so late September through the month of October uh, is, is really our danger time here locally across Florida and most of the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, busy season underway. Uh, I'm sure we'll have threats, hopefully no direct landfalls coming our way, but I'm sure we'll have some threats to our area here over the next uh, several weeks to as much as six weeks from now. So we're pretty confident it's making a difference. Uh, it's being used nationwide now. Uh, it is one of only six warnings, at least in the state of Florida, that goes out through the wireless emergency alert system and gets to people's cell phones. So it's meant to be used very, very sparingly. Uh, but when it is needed, that warning re message really is getting out to the people that, that need to hear it and need to take shelter. And I think it is making a, a tremendous difference across the area to, to keep people safe from those uh, really imminent winds when they're going to pick up suddenly, just like a tornado. Uh, again, people have been waiting for the hurricane. They know it's been coming uh, for days. They're in that preparation mode. But this is that final last minute warning to get people's attention to say, your immediate area is imminently going to receive these very, very extreme life-threatening winds and to take that last uh, few seconds of precaution that you can to get yourself uh, to a safe location. The National Weather Service has already begun issuing extreme wind warnings experimentally in other high wind events like derechos. The goal is to implement these warnings in non-tornadic events to help elevate the threat and help the public prepare for these destructive and extreme high wind events. 
For My Radar, I'm Chief Meteorologist Leslie Hudson. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.